no, if you're live. Take it away. It's live. I can see yeah, it. Yeah, it looks good. That's fine. Okay, we're live. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the Astro Imaging Channel. Or I always think that maybe there's someone in Europe who got up early. So good morning to those people. Hopefully you're there. Tonight we have a very, well, we always have interesting presenters, but tonight we have another interesting presenter, uh, Ron Palmier. Uh, Rod and I talked uh, over about a year ago and he said, well, why don't we, you know, I suggested we might image together. And he said, you know, I had an observatory and I'm going to build another one. And this is a good time to do it. So, of course, everything went smoothly, didn't it, for the past year? Right? Oh, no, it didn't go smoothly. It went something but smoothly. And Ron is going to tell us all about his adventures and misadventures in building his observatory, which is now done and up and running, which is fantastic. Um, next week, we have Ron Hedden. He's going to talk to us a little bit. Ron, you want to give us you know, your elevator pitch on next week's presentation? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be talking about processing your images using free software or shareware uh, for people who might be interested in coming up the learning curve on processing without spending a lot of money. And I'll cover programs like GIMP, uh, Ciro, Images Plus, etc. And I'll be working through uh, some data you can download, uh, Terry Robeson's NGC 55 data from earlier this year and probably also taking a look at some uglier data sets that are mine to show you how to do things like remove star halos. So that'll be next week. That's fantastic. And I can tell you that a lot of us have tried out GIMP. It's an excellent program. Some of the others I haven't, but it's capable for those people that don't want to invest in paying Adobe monthly rent for Photoshop. GIMP is a very capable program. So I'm going to share my screen here for just a moment. Share a screen. Share entire window. And I think it's coming up. Okay, we're here. Uh, this is our schedule. Uh, now we hit tonight. We have Rod. Next week we have. Ron, then we have Neil Hay. It said to be announced. I have no idea what Niels is going to do, but I'm sure it's something interesting. The week after that, we have our workshop, and Kevin Moorfield posted an excellent data set from uh, Chile. And we're going to have people tell us how they work with the data set and showed some of their images and their processes. And um, Kevin's going to be on as well. And by the way, even though it might be a little late, you can still kind of send in your images. We're going to have a little montage of those images from Kevin's data. You can still send that in. And again, it's excellent data. And most of us don't have the capability of getting this kind of data. So when we posted it, I would suggest people download it, and at least for their own benefit, analyze the data. Who do we have after that? After the workshop, Sean Walker. We're going to talk about how to gen alpha sky survey. Very interesting. Um, Palmer, after that, on uh, Nina, another target selection. Nina is another bit of free software. And we have a, everything filled up probably through October. So those people that might like to volunteer to do a presentation, please go to uh, our site, put in your little note that's saying, hey, I'd like to present. And we'll have a conversation with you and hopefully get you on the schedule. So I think I covered most everything. And Ron, Ron, I turn it over to you. Tell us all about your adventures in building a new observatory. I say that with a laugh because I know what you've gone through. Yes. Thank you, Eric. All right, and I'll take a verbal confirmation. I'm showing up on your broadcast screen. Looks we good. We got it. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Rod Pommier, and it's a pleasure to be back with you again. And I know that um, uh, Molly put out a banner uh, on YouTube saying that the title of this was going to be Dome versus Dome. So there was going to be a knockout, drag out fight, and one dome would emerge victorious over the other. 
And actually, there are, I'm going to talk about two domes tonight, and uh, there are things I love about both of them and things I dislike about both of them. So I renamed this t talk uh, with a more apt title of A Tale of Two Domes. And I think you can tell from the big red X that I modeled that title after the title of a novel uh, that's one of my favorites by one of my favorite authors, Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. And as soon as I put that on a slide, it reminded me of the immortal opening line of that novel, which says, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I thought, now is that ever an apt description of astrophotography? We all get our telescopes and our computers and our mounts and our cameras, hoping we're going to go out and take beautiful images of the universe and surely have the best of times. But then we run smack dab into how difficult and challenging of a hobby this is with things like collimation, focus, auto guiding, dew control, uh, not to mention all the things we run into in post-processing of dealing with gradients and stretching images and we can come to believe that surely we are living in the worst of times. So I think the purpose of the Astro Imaging Channel is to help us all maximize the best of times and minimize the worst of times. As a longtime astrophotographer, I can tell you I've done my share of the worst of times. And even if you're not interested in dome observatory, stick around because I'm going to tell you how I overcame some of the my most challenging, vexing problems I had with my primary imaging system once I got it into a dome. And as Alex is always saying when he's advertising for uh, presenters, if you came up with a way to solve a problem, go ahead and tell us about it, even if it's really basic. So uh, stick around for that. So I think one of the ways that we can try to get the best of times is that many of us dream that someday we may get a permanent imaging setup in an observatory of our own. And the advantages of having your own observatory are tremendous. And a lot of them have to do with time. So first of all, there's no setup time. You don't have to take out your telescope and your tripod and your mount and your cameras and hook all those things up and run all the cabling and things because it's out there ready to go. And once you get it set up, if you're gonna do astrophotography, you've gotta have a really good polar alignment so that you can accurately target your subjects and do decent tracking. And with an observatory, you could lock in a precise permanent polar alignment for accurate tracking and targeting. And even if you get to the point where you've got everything all set up, you may not be ready to image right away because you brought that telescope in from a warm house out into a cold winter night and it's got to cool down to ambient temperature. Well, again, that's not a problem with an observatory because your telescope's already out there at ambient temperature. I think a lot of the time saving really comes on the other end when you're done imaging because there's no takedown time. And that's when we're tired. And let's face it, we all quit a lot earlier than we would really want to because we know we have to take all this stuff down. With an observatory, you just shut it down and you can go turn in. And oh, but wait, before you take down that telescope, you're going to take the camera off of it and you're going to lose that precious orientation you had for your flats. So you got to shoot those flats before you go turn in. And with an observatory, you can leave the camera on the telescope. You can come back in the morning or some other time and still get those flats the way they're supposed to be. And even if you want to shoot bias and dark frames, you've got to get out your camera and hook it up to your computer and shoot them. And again, with an observatory, you can pretty much do that anytime you want. And we get bonus nights where the forecast may say it's gonna be cloudy, but suddenly there's a big break in the clouds. You say, man, I really could use some extra data on M33, but you know that some of those windows are pretty short. And by the time you get everything out there and all set up, it may cloud up again and you just end up having to take it all down. But if you have an observatory, you can maximize your capture of those unexpected clear periods. And it will give you security. While your equipment is out there, ready to go, it's protected from people, animals, and even insects. Now, if you decide to get an observatory, you're gonna to have to make a really critical decision. Am I gonna get a roll-off roof observatory or am I gonna get a dome observatory? And I can tell you, based on my many years of experience, there's no place like dome, there's no place like dome, there's no place like dome. Over 
the years, I've had 25 years of experience with a Technical Innovations 10-foot Pro-Dome Fiberglass Observatory, and I've used that to house my rare Celestron CompuStar C14 telescope. And as Eric was mentioning, I recently upgraded that to a metal 10-foot 6-inch ash dome, and that is now housing my new plane wave CDK 400 system, which is a CDK 17 on an L500 mount. So I feel very qualified to give you uh, reviews of these observatories, how you get them, how you set them up, and all the things go. But to get there, I think it's only fair that we go through my life as an astrophotographer. After all, I had to. Uh, but all kidding aside, I think that this will explain how we got, how I got into a dome and why it was so important to me. So I started astrophotography back in 1986 when I was still a surgical resident. And I bought this Celestron Super C8 Plus. And I was doing film astrophotography out in the dark skies of Central Oregon. We would photograph on hypersensitized film that had been baked in a concoction of forming gas of nitrogen and hydrogen to make it more sensitive. And it was cooled out in the field with dry ice. And these were the days of hand guiding your images, not auto guiding. You had to sit there all night and look through a glow in the dark reticle at your guide star and use a drive corrector to correct the position of the guide star by hand. And that could be a very long, tedious process because you're holding still and you're not generating much muscle heat and you could get really, really cold. And I started publishing uh, articles based on the images I took. I would write up the objects I was photographing and uh, publishing them in Astronomy Magazine. And you know, down here you can see a film image of NGC 55. And you know, back in the 1990s, that was the state of the art uh, compared to the, the data we just all processed for, with Terry Robeson on NGC 55 taken digitally. I also published a few articles on astrophotographic techniques I developed. This is an article I published in Sky and Telescope on how to make an overlay of the field of view of your camera and uh, your off-axis guider in various positions relative to the camera frame that you could use with Hans Varenberg's Atlas of Deep Sky Splendors. This had virtually every object you would ever want to photograph printed uh, in wide field images at the same scale. So uh, if you made the overlay at the same scale as the images, you could pick out what was the way to frame your image and where to put your off-axis guider relative to the camera frame and find the best possible guide star. So this was long before we had computer programs that we do now that will do this for you. And then I finally got a job and I decided I could buy a big telescope, the one that I'd wanted for a very long, long time. And that was gonna be a C14. But Celestron had just come out with a very special version of their schmidt cassegrain telescopes called the CompuStars. So I got one of those. And here's a much younger me out on my deck with the uh, my first day with my CompuStar C14. So what is important about these is that these, this was the very first go-to telescope produced. So if you now enjoy a go-to mount, you owe a great debt of, debt of gratitude to the CompuStars because they were first. So um, what it did is they, Celestron took a telescope on a fork mount, they powered it with stepper motors, and the stepper motors were controlled by a computer with a database. And the computer, as you can see on the image on the right, was about the size of an Etch-a-Sketch, and it displayed a tremendous amount of knowledge. It had 16 soft keys, which meant they executed different functions depending on the sequence of keys that you put them in. And uh, I still think that a lot of telescopes just don't even equal what you could uh, see in terms of displays and information about a CompuStar. So um, I no longer have this telescope, uh, but it's there's a program here called the CompuStar Emulator. So um, as you can see, it's telling me here that NGC 6960, which is the uh, Witch's Room Nebula, it's got its coordinates, it's got its magnitude, it's got its size at 1.2 degrees. It has a visual rating of the object, which is good. Uh, and if you happen to see some, you know, you could slew to M13 if you wanted to. So we just hit slew, M13. 
enter, and off it goes to that. And of course, it's telling me now that that's a globular cluster with a rating of excellent, it's magnitude 5.9, and it's 17 arc minutes across. And if you happen to spot that little galaxy up on one side of, it, of M13, you could uh, adjust the telescope to get that. You could hit the field button, and it would tell you that it was NGC 6207, which is magnitude 11.6 and three arc minutes across, and has a fair visual rating. So what I really loved about this telescope is that you could program it to take you on tours. So if you took this scan button and then you could tell it you wanted to find globular clusters and you wanted to have them all be brighter than magnitude 10.0 and you wanted them to be larger than seven arc minutes in size, and you wanted them to be higher than 30 degrees above the horizon. And you wanted them to have a better rating than, say, good. Uh, it would take you on that tour. And you could also put the pause button and say, I want to look at each one of these objects for 30 seconds or a minute. And it would do, it would do that for you. So that was the kind of uh, work I was doing with the CompuStar C14 in the city. And that turned out to be a really powerful combination for me. Um, what I would do is, you know, if you if you look up articles about the CompuStar C14, they will tell you that you may run into somebody with it, and they will be in love with this telescope and very unwilling to part with it. Uh, this has the record of being the rarest mass-produced schmidt Cassegrain telescope in history. Only about 100 of them were made. And we all know who each other are. We're together on a, a thing called the CompuStar Users Group. My best CompuStar friend is Tom Sorbel in Plymouth, Minnesota, who did a lot of work on uh, making chips for this to carry this telescope into the 21st century. But we're all very devoted to these telescopes and lovingly maintain them and try to improve them. And later on, you're gonna see what struggles I went through to make this into an astrograph in the city of Portland. And I'm, I'm pretty sure people like Eric Coles will have kittens over that saying, why did you work so hard and not just get a, a, a different telescope? But uh, that's what I did. So after, on this very night uh, that I took this picture, I punched in a few things and the CompuStar took me around the sky in a way I had never, ever experienced. I mean, after years of finder scopes and star charts and star hopping and star drift method, everything I wanted to see was right there. And so I came up with a formula and I said, what I'll do is I'm gonna use my CompuStar C14 under the light polluted skies of Portland to find interesting, beautiful, and maybe even obscure objects I can write articles about. Then I'll drive out to the dark skies of Central Oregon with my Super C8 Plus, and I'll take film astrographs to illustrate those articles. And that was really successful for me. I mean, I published quite a number of articles about secret summer star clusters that you could actually see under light polluted skies, or obscure globular clusters that weren't in the Messier catalog, or galaxy clusters. And what I did is what a lot of people do. Uh, that telescope was too big to uh, set up and take down all the time, and I certainly couldn't take it out to Central Oregon to use it as an astrograph. So I wrapped it up in tarps uh, with bungee cords and uh, unwrapped it when I wanted to use it. And one time I made a trip back to New York City where I trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering for a, a conference, and I had a house sitter. And when I came back, I said, how'd things go? And she says, oh, fine, nothing much happened. Oh, by the way, one night the wind blew the tarp off your telescope, but I covered it up for you again. And as you can see, I had this thing really wrapped up with ropes and, and bungee cords. I thought, that can't happen. So I went out and unwrapped it, and the uh, it was obvious someone had tried to steal that telescope. The gears had all been stripped. Uh, they didn't know how to take it apart, so fortunately they left it in one piece. But the gears had been stripped. It was left out in the rain, and the optical tube and the drive base had filled up with rain. And I had to take it all down and send it into Celestron to be uh, rejuvenated and, and renovated. And it was at that point that I said, I need an observatory. So I had to make a decision. Did I want a roll off roof observatory or a dome observatory? Now there are lots of advantages of a roll off roof observatory. The construction is fairly simple. It, it uses common construction skills used to build houses or small sheds, which a lot of people possess. 
The movements of the roof are linear, so that can be done with commonly available straight materials and simple rollers will serve. And this means that for a lot of people, you could build this from scratch yourself if you possess those skills. And all of that adds up to a much lower cost of getting an observatory. The observatory will be open to the entire sky, which means you don't have to go out and rotate anything or need any motors to rotate something. And it also means that if you're someone like Molly that has five different setups, you can put them all in a roll-off observatory and point them at different regions of the sky and image all those different regions of sky simultaneously. There are some disadvantages. For one is that you have to have a place to store the roof when it comes off the observatory, which means you need twice the area of the actual observatory. It isn't such a simple matter to have a roof that goes on and off. It's, it has to block the rain and the dust from getting in from underneath that roof on top of the building from both the top, the sides, and the ends. And that can take some uh, complicated baffling and, and construction. And the design has to prevent the wind from blowing that roof off when it's in both the closed and the open positions. And again, that can be a, a little bit difficult to achieve. These things tend to have a high overall weight. So if you're on soft soil that tends to shift and settle, you may find that the pylons holding up your uh, roof when it's off position may shift and that gets your railings out of alignment. And generally these roofs are quite heavy and have a high weight that can contribute to that. And that also means that the roof may require a high force to open either by hand or by motor. Once opened, the telescope is exposed to multiple things. One of them is the wind. The wind can still hit the telescope and shake it and that can give you jiggly stars. And it's open to the surrounding environment that might have stray light. By being open to the entire sky, yeah, you can image in lots of different directions, but you're also gonna have a lot more radiation of heat out into space off that telescope. And so there's, it's much more apt to have dew formation and even ice formation. And sad to say, people going by can see that telescope and somebody could possibly vandalize it. They could decide they wanna throw a brick at your telescope and hit it. The wind that I was mentioning earlier won't just shake the telescope, but it's gonna hit a flat wall and that causes turbulence to spill over the top of the telescope and that can degrade seeing conditions. Now there are advantages of a dome observatory. For one, it takes up much less area and therefore you can get it to fit in much smaller spaces. And the reason this may be important is that in a lot of cities, observatories are classified as accessory or temporary buildings. And the implication of that is in that many cities, as long as your accessory or temporary building is less than 100 square feet, it may be exempt from building permits. So to illustrate this, suppose you wanted to make a 10 foot by 10 foot roll off roof observatory. Well, that's already 100 square feet, so you might need to get permits in many cities. But don't forget, you need to have this other space where you store the roof. And most cities are gonna classify that as part of the structure. So now you're up to 200 square feet where you would clearly be required to have permits. Compare and contrast that to a 10 foot dome. It's a circle and so the square foot area is gonna be pi times the radius squared. That turns out to be 78.5 square feet, well under 100. So you could actually get up to about a 12 foot dome and still not need to have a permit for that. The dome will have a lip or a flange that is a ring completely surrounding its supporting structure. And that protects it from rain and dust entering from virtually all directions in 360 degrees. These things have lower overall weight. So again, if you're on soft soil where things may shift and sag, uh, that is less of a concern. And in general, the dome will weigh less than a corresponding roof of similar size, and therefore it would take less force to rotate it. Now this has also some disadvantages. And one is that you're gonna have much reduced, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still on advantages, sorry. So with the reduced sky exposure, you get less dew and not no dew, but less dew. And you won't get any ice. I mean, there have been nights where I've had my uh, CompuStar 14 in the observatory working and I have my C8 out on the driveway. On a cold night, the C8 would form ice. I have never, ever seen ice form inside my dome. Uh, that 
enclosure will give you protection from the wind. The wind will not go inside the dome slot and shake your telescope simply because it has no exit, so it won't even enter. And that wrapping around also protects you from stray light, and people can't really see your telescope unless they're perfectly lined up with the shutter slot. And the wind that isn't going in your dome will also flow smoothly over the curved surface of the dome and not create turbulence. And that results in better seeing conditions for the telescope. And let's not forget the biggest advantage of having a dome, it looks like an observatory, as opposed to looking like some kind of a tool shed or something in the backyard. Now they do have disadvantages of dome observatories. It's a complicated design and a complicated construction. It would be difficult for someone to fabricate the curved parts that are needed to build a dome by yourself. So you're likely gonna need to buy a, a dome if you're gonna have one. And that means it's gonna come with a higher cost. Uh, you're gonna have a limited view of the sky through that shutter. You're not gonna be able to do multiple imaging setups to the same degree that you could with a roll off roof observatory. So this was the house that I used to live in when I first got this dome. And uh, this is a three-story house, but it's built into a side of a cliff high in Portland Heights above Portland. And there was only one small piece of level ground where I could hope to put the observatory, and it was right there. So clearly a roll-off roof observatory wasn't going to work for me, and I was going to select a dome. So reading Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine for years, I'd seen multiple ads put up by technical innovations for their home dome and pro dome fiberglass observatories. So technical innovations manufactures domes with three different diameters, six foot, 10 foot, or 15 foot. They have two models. So the first one is called a home dome, and that is the dome itself with its base supporting ring with the flange. And that could be put on your own house if you wanted to cut a hole in the roof or a support building that you fabricated yourself. And the other model is called the Pro Dome, which is the same as a home dome, a dome and a base ring, but it comes with whatever number of wall rings you want to order to build up a wall. And they provide a lot of options. You know, if you live in Santa Fe, you can't have something in your yard unless it's Adobe colored, so they can do that for you. They can color the dome whatever color you want. Um, you can get in if you get a door, otherwise you have to climb in and out through the actual shutter slot. And, you know, I was going to have a very tall observatory and that meant that the apex of the shutter would be quite high above me. So they offer an electric shutter motor that will open and close it. And they also offer electric dome rotation motors to rotate the dome for you. So I made my technical innovations order. I ordered a 10 foot pro dome with the base ring and I got it in white. And then I ordered three additional one foot high wall rings. So that would give me a total wall height with the base ring of four feet. I wanted a door with the door jam section so that I could get in and out of the observatory and not have to climb in and out through the shutter slot. And I said earlier, you know, with the, with the shutter going nine feet above me at its apex, I wanted the electric shutter motor. And I ordered two of the electric dome rotation motors. They're positioned 180 degrees opposite each other in the walls. Now, you can't just build an observatory because you want to. Cities have building and zoning codes and you may need permits. In fact, you may need multiple permits depending on where you live and what the codes are. And some people are members of homeowners associations, and you may have to get clearance from the homeowners association that you are a part of to get uh, permission to put an observatory in your neighborhood. Now, I can give you one clue that I found was helpful, and that is if you're willing to offer your observatory to be a community resource, it can greatly increase the odds of a successful application. If you're near a grade school or a high school or you have some Boy Scout, Girl Scout troops in the neighborhood, if you offer to hold an astronomy night or a stargazing party uh, to those groups, it can greatly increase the chances that your permit will be granted. And if you're gonna run power out to the uh, observatory, which most of us would, uh, you're gonna need electrical permits. So back to my home, this is the street view, and I needed a ton of permits for this observatory at this house. First of all, this is considered a view property. The house is facing uh, Portland's iconic Mount Hood, but over here behind this tree was Mount Jefferson, and over here I had a view of Mount uh, 
Adams and up here I'm at the view of Mount St. Helens with Mount Rainier peeking over the top. And the city of Portland considers the views from Portland Heights to be uh, a community resource. It was not surprising for me to walk out on my deck and find strangers standing there. And I'd say, can I help you? And it's like, oh, we're just enjoying your view of Mount uh, Hood and Mount St. Helens. It's like, okay, can I get you a drink or something? Uh, it, it really, that that's Portland for you. Um, so I had to write essays of how placement of the dome was gonna affect the view for pedestrians, bicycle and motorcycle riders, automobile drivers and truck drivers. I kid you not. So that took me pages and pages and pages to write up. Um, this house was also built by a famous architect by the name of Van Everett Bailey, and he was Portland's version of Frank Lloyd Wright. So I had to write an architectural impact statement because uh, you know the city of Portland wasn't going to let me uh, make a drastic change to the architecture of this home without their approval. So these were all the permits and application that I had to fill out to put a 10-foot dome in that spot. And once I got it all done, I thought, okay, we're in. But I quickly got a phone call from someone in the city of Portland, and they said, I'm sorry, I can't approve your application. And I thought, gee, what is it, the view? Is it the architectural problem? And he said, oh, no. He says, you're building it half on city property. And I was flabbergasted. How can that be? It's like behind my head. And he goes, yeah, that's city property. He says, this entire zone here from the edge of the street to halfway up to your house is actually an easement that's owned by the city of Portland. It's there so that we can put in sidewalks, curbs, gutters, parking, fire hydrants, uh, all that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, a lot of people in your neighborhood have landscaped this, but sorry, it belongs to us. So I was devastated. I thought, I don't have another place I can put this. Uh, but this is where building an observatory as opposed to some other kind of structure can really help you out because the guy said, wow, I'm looking at your plans and drawings here. He says, this is really cool. I would really like to see you be able to do this. And he said, tell you what, give me a couple of days and uh, I'll see what I can do. And a few days, excuse me, a few days later, I got a call from the fire chief and the chief of police on a conference call. And they said, yeah, you're trying to put this half on city property, but I'll tell you what, we really wanna see you do this. So if you'll sign a piece of paper that says, if we ever do build those sidewalks, curbs and gutters, you will move the observatory, we'll let you put it in. So I said, done, and I signed the paper. So my prodome arrived in a very large crate that measured eight feet by eight feet by five feet. It weighed about a thousand pounds. And I unloaded all those parts into my garage and I constructed this observatory all by my little self. So these were the parts. We had dome quadrants here. There were four of those. These are three shutter pieces that go over the dome slot. Here we have enough wall rings and base rings for a four foot high wall. And then we had two sections of door jams, a left door jam and a right door jam. And over here were four segments for the door. So you start constructing this by bolting together the four segments of a door jam. And you do that for both the left door jam and the right door jam. And so here I completed one of my door jams. This is the left door jam viewed from outside. And you can see I have the three wall rings on the bottom and then the base ring with the flange to keep out dust and rain on the top. And then you put together the four segments that make up the door. And there's my completed door section. And then you construct the front entrance of the observatory. So on the left hand, I've got the right door jam is viewed from the outside, and then the door, and then the left door jam. And then what you do to that is you start arcing these wall rings around from the door jam until you do a complete 360 degree circle. And so I got a deck contractor to build a deck for me that I could mount this observatory on, which was, again, it was gonna be half my property, half city property. And, you know, what wanted to put this on was gonna be a 10 foot by 10 foot deck. And the contractor came to me and says, okay, this is a 10 foot by 10 foot deck. And I said, yeah, of course. And he said, it's hundred square feet. You're gonna need a whole new set of permits. And I thought, no, not that nightmare again. So uh, if you notice the unusual shape of the deck, I told them to cut off one corner and that dropped it down to about 98 square feet, no permits required. And he said, wow, in all my years of building decks, 
that was brilliant. I never saw anybody do that. So um, then you take the wall rings and you basically lay them out on the deck and you have to measure the diameter and get it as circular as possible across 12 different diameters coming out to be 10 feet. And it also needs to be precisely level. You can't use a bubble level for this. You actually have to use a water level where you have tubing where the water seeks its own level. So you shim it as you have to. And then you just keep repeating that process with one wall ring after another until you get up to the base ring on top. And the base ring contains rollers that you install, and that's what's going to allow the observatory to rotate around. And then the observatory is going to rotate around on that wall on what's called the dome support ring. So you assemble that. And it's really important that both the wall structure and the dome support ring be as absolutely circular as possible. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And over to the right, it's got a swing out section that swings out with the door so that you can go in and out. And then you take the dome quadrants and you bolt them together along this thing that's called the Greenwich Meridian down here. And two dome quadrants make up what is known as a dome hemisphere. And then on a non-windy day, because these dome hemispheres make really good sails, uh, you get a friend to help you hoist them up onto the dome support ring and bolt them down. And you leave the gap in the middle for the shutters. And then the shutters go on top and I finally completed my dome observatory in my yard and I mounted the CompuStar C14 inside on a pier and a wedge. So with that, man, my observing time went up dramatically. I was spending hours and hours just delighting and observing everything I could and I started to get an itch that I really wanted to convert this CompuStar C14 into some kind of an astrograph and take pictures with it. Uh, what was happening then that I thought might make that possible was the digital revolution. I was using film and out were coming CCD cameras. And uh, I wasn't interested at first because I kept calling us big and they told me, well, the ST7 is about this big as shown in the little red square and the ST8, which was more extensive, had a slightly bigger chip. But these were still the fraction of a size of a uh, 35 millimeter uh, film frame. And so I was joining what Dennis DeChico was saying in Sky and Telescope. He said, when they make a CCD camera that has a chip as big as a 35 millimeter uh, film uh, frame, you know, maybe then I'll get one. Uh, and then guess what? S Big met the challenge. They came out with the STL large format 11,000 camera, which had a chip that was the same size as a 35 millimeter uh, film frame. So now I was really interested and I really wanted to get one of these and start using it for imaging with my CompuStar C14. Unfortunately, the CompuStar C14 has a host of issues that make it quite difficult to convert into a successful astrograph. First of all, it's native Focal ratio is f11, which is photographically quite slow. So we'd want to try to speed that up. Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes have coma. The stars in the corner are all comma shaped. And this was not an edge like Celestron makes currently with the C14. It was a classic uh, C14 that didn't have the lenses in it for coma correction. Schmidt Cassegrain telescopes are also notorious for having mirror flop. They focus by moving the primary mirror back and forth on the central baffle. And there's a little bit of a gap there so that it can move. And so when you move the telescope in one direction or another or focus it, that mirror can flop. And this is especially a problem for the C14, which has a very heavy primary mirror. So even when you're tracking uh, from something rising in the east up towards the meridian, that mirror will flop and will throw your focus out of kilter and the collimation as well. Sadly, the uh, worm gear drive in this telescope was not very good. And the CompuStar C14 had a very large periodic error that will result in trailed stars. And, you know, a lot of companies have dealt with this with a, with a, a technique known as periodic error correction, where you can record the errors in your guiding and then play it back to the mount and it gets rid of it. But this telescope was made before periodic error correction was ever available, so it didn't have that capability. And the biggest bugaboo is it had no auto guiding capability. 
or does it? We'll talk about that a little bit later on. So what I decided to do before I splurged for a, a SDL 11,000 was to get myself a Canon 20D DSLR. They had CMOS chips that were almost as big as a 35 millimeter frame. And I said, let's see how digital photography works in the city. So I connected this uh, Canon 20D to my CompuStar 14 in my dome. And uh, this gave me my second best astronomy night ever. I mean, the combination of this go-to telescope and a digital camera was just enchanting. I could point it at M13, and whereas I used to have to guide for hours with film, in a matter of 30 seconds, I could see it on the screen. And, you know, things like M27 and M57 had color in them. Um, so my family later on called out to me on the intercom, the observatory, and said, hey, you said you were going out there for a few minutes. You've been out there for hours. And I said, yeah, I'm having my second best astronomy night ever. So what I realized at that moment is that I could do astrophotography in this city if I could stack a series of short digital exposures. And I would get better results with that than I got with long exposure film photography out in the dark skies of central Oregon. But how was I going to guide? Well, I thought I can manually guide these like I did my pictures with my uh, Celestron C8. But you know, this is high resolution astrophotography and frequently there's only one guide star that you can pick off in your off axis guider. And sometimes that's in a very inconvenient location. Like you know, down here, I'd have to be upside down and backwards underneath the telescope uh, looking at my guide star trying to guide. So what you really want to put in there instead would be a off-axis guider camera. But without the capability of auto guiding, that was essentially going to be useless. So one day I was looking at the manual for the CompuStar C14. And you know, when you talk about the speed button, it says you push that button and you select one of three speeds, either slew to move to targets rapidly, set to sort of adjust the final position, and guide if you're going to manually guide with those four guide buttons that are arranged in a diamond shape. But I noticed something very strange every time I did that. So let's go back here to this emulator. And notice that when I hit speed, I actually got four choices. Slew, set, guide, and auto. And when you put slew once, you get one beeps. When you hit set, you get two beeps. When you hit manual guide, you get three beeps. When you hit auto, I got four beeps and it says auto. And I thought, what is auto? So I decided to call Celestron and they took a while to find somebody who was around when the CompuStars were made. And he said, oh, he said, that's for the auto guider. And I was absolutely shocked. They said, yeah, we built auto guiding capability into the computer and we were going to build and sell auto guiders for it. But, you know, the, the telescope just didn't sell. Um, you know, sadly, a CompuStar C14 sold in the late 1980s for the, about the same amount of money uh, in, as a CDK17 does now in 2023 dollars. So they just didn't sell a lot of them. But I said, where does the auto guider go? And he says, well, there are three DB9 plugs on the front of the computer. The left one is for a printer, so you can print out all the things you saw that night. The right one is for a joystick. The middle one is for an auto guider. And he said, you know, we've got a diagram of the auto guider we were gonna build. Uh, and he said, I can send it to you if you wanna try to build one. I said, please do. Now this was all Greek to me. I am not an electrical engineer. But Portland is a very computer uh, savvy town. We have Intel and Floating Point and Hewlett Packard. So I sent this diagram out to all kinds of companies trying to find any electrical engineer who would be willing to build me this auto guider and nobody responded. And it said down here that, you know, these parts were available at Radio Shack. So one day I went to Radio Shack and I was trying to see if um, they had these parts. And the gentleman behind the counter said, yeah, we have those parts. But I ran into an old friend, uh, a man named Alan Yaunis, and he used to be an electrical engineer at Oregon Health and Science University, but he'd long since left to go work at Lewis and Clark Law School. And he said, Dr. Pommier, what are you doing here? And I said, well, strange you should ask. I said, I'm trying to find, you know, parts and see if I can build this uh, auto guider. He said, I'm an electrical engineer. I'll build it for you. 
and that was just so providential. So he got the parts and he built this auto guider and I was able to plug it into my CompuStar C14 and now I had auto guiding capability. So I wrote all that up. I mean, I had to learn a lot about auto guiding. I had to learn about ST4 language and pin ins and pin outs and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of other CompuStar users have used this manual that I wrote up to make their own auto guiders like that. So the next problem I had to conquer was coma. And fortunately, Starzona came out with a large format reducer corrector for the C11 and the C14. And this gave my C14 an F ratio, not of F11, but of F7.5. So it would be a lot faster and it got rid of the coma in the corners. But even with the auto guider, the periodic error on this um, telescope was so poor that the auto guider just couldn't keep up and I still ended up with trailed stars. So I had to find a way to get rid of that problem. And this was a really heavy chunk of glass. This weighs nearly six pounds that I'm putting on the back of the CompuStar. Well, the way I got around the periodic error was I bought a unit of adaptive optics. When we hear about adaptive optics, we hear about, you know, special computers that use actuators to change the shape of a mirror at a major observatory and dampen out the effects of seeing. That's not really what this does. Uh, this is actually a super auto guider is what it is. So it has a refractive plate here on a tilt plate, and this is actuated by little piston motors. And this thing will make guiding corrections up to 10 times per second. And it has a limited range. These pistons are only gonna move the image so far, but if you start getting near the edge of the range, it'll then command the auto guider to kick in. And you know, while you're, you're having the adaptive optics keep your star as centered as possible, you've got lots of time for that uh, auto guider to nudge the uh, telescope mount and get that star back within the center of range of the adaptive optics. So, um, you know, I could have changed the mounting on this telescope and gotten a better one for many, you know, $15,000, $20,000, but for a lot less money, I was getting something that was able to produce, uh, you know, nice round stars uh, for about $1,200. So several companies besides SBIG, if you don't have an SBIG camera, Starlight Express makes an adaptive optics and so does Orion. And it's a really good way to get yourself the equivalent of a $15,000 to $20,000 mount for a lot less money. So now I'm getting a really long imaging train. I've got this star zona reducer corrector that weighs nearly six pounds, and then an adapter, and then the SAOL uh, adaptive optics back, followed by the camera. And this put a lot of weight, uh, you know, I'm not showing it here, but there was a lot of weight on the boom arm of this mount. And that worked great as long as things were rising in the east. It kept the drive gear engaged, but once things got down to the bottom, I found out that those stepper motors on the copy star really didn't have the power to lift it up and cross the meridian. So that meant I was only gonna be able to image east of the meridian, which I could do, but I wasn't really getting the full promise of having an observatory where you could image all night long. I still had to conquer the problem of mirror flop. You know, and as the telescope climbed, the mirror would flop over, throw off my collimation and my focusing. And so that was a big problem. And I thought, well, let me get a focuser rotator. Um, but when I applied that, it was way too much weight. And the telescope motor, stepper motors of the Star couldn't handle it all. It just stalled out and made grinding noises. So, that meant I was gonna to have to use the native focus knob of the C14. And so the way I got around focusing and collimation was I got this mask, which is called a gold focus plus mask. And it provides much more accurate focusing than a Batonov mask. Um, I was using a Batonov mask prior and I thought I was in focus. Well, I can tell you this thing told me I was still pretty far from focus. It's actually, reported to be three to five times more accurate, and I confirm that to be true. Um, but the other beautiful thing is, this is the fastest way I have found to ever collimate a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. So what you do is you put the mask on the front of the telescope, take an image of a bright star, and the software will pull it up, and it analyzes the diffraction pattern, and it tells you that you need to focus in, say, 2.3 units. It uses the word pixel, but it, it's just an arbitrary unit. And when you get 
focus that's near perfect, it tells you. And it also has these three numbers, and these correspond to the three um, uh, set screws on the secondary mirror of a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, and it tells you how far you have to turn them in one direction or another to achieve perfect collimation. And so, you know, I just looked at this diagram and I said, that, yeah, those three arrows correspond to the three set screws. And all I had to do was figure out which way I had to turn them to be positive or negative. And you could get perfect collimation in that region of the sky in a matter of seconds. So now the question became, how am I gonna hold my focus and my collimation as I continue imaging through the night? Well, it turns out there was actually a good solution for that as well. These are shipping screws that come on the back of a C-14. You disengage them when you get the telescope and back them out. But if you're gonna ship the telescope anywhere, you screw them into the back of the mirror. And there's a man in Kapolei, Hawaii, named Thomas Esmeralda, who capitalized on that. He has a company called Zap Steel Custom Machining, and he makes flop stoppers. And so you take those shipping screws out and you install the flop scrap, st excuse me, flop stoppers, and you screw these black knobs into the back of the primary mirror. And then you can set your focus with the focusing knob. And once you have your focus and your collimation set, you just simply set those things in place with the set screws. And the focus knob provides the third point of fixation between a triangle, which makes up a plane. And that will hold the focus and the collimation for you. So the last problem I had to conquer was rotator. And again, with high resolution astrophotography, often there's one and only one guide star available to you. And you have to figure out where it is. And so with this, it tells me I need to rotate my camera to a position angle of 250 degrees. And if you do imaging on different nights on different targets, you know, you will need to come back to that same rotation angle. Otherwise, you end up with these Know, frames that are askew from each other and you only have a certain amount of common area in the final image and you have to crop out the uncommon areas and you get a much smaller image. You might as well be imaging with a much smaller chip. So I tried to reproduce the rotation on different nights by looking at the positions of the stars on the frame and that was wildly unsuccessful. It turned out I was way, way off. But then I thought, as I was working with the sky X and something, I said, you know, look at this right ascension line that the software shows you. You can see how that intersects the edges of the frame and the same thing with the declination line. And so, you know, if I need a position angle of 250, it's simple geometry to figure out that that angle and that angle are both gonna be 60 degrees. So isn't it too bad that when I'm centering this object on my uh, CCD chip, I can't see those lines because then I could set them to 60 degrees and I'd have my rotation and it would be really reproducible. And then one night it occurred to me, I could see those lines. So this is a technique that I've taught to some of my astrophotography mentees and they've affectionately dubbed it Rodney's rotator. So note that we have a polar aligned mount. And that means that the mount slews along the right ascension and the declination axes. So what you do is you center a bright star on the chip and then you start a five or six second exposure. And while you're doing that, hit slew for either the right ascension or the declination axis on your telescope mount controller. And when you do that, that star will draw a straight line that is a right ascension line on your chip. And similarly, if you hit the declination, it will draw a line that is equivalent to a declination line just like we saw on the Sky X. So I got a protractor and I just put that up on the image and you can get a precise reading of the rotation of your camera relative to the sky. And you can set it to the 60 degrees you want and it's very reproducible. So that gave me my procedure for doing a night's worth of imaging. What you do is you slew to a bright star near your target. You set the rotation angle with Rodney's rotator, focus and collimate with the gold focus mask lock that in with the flop stoppers, slew to your target, acquire your guide star and your off-axis guider camera and calibrate it, then start the adaptive optics for precise tracking despite the periodic error and begin imaging. And so I did that for a lot of years and um, I was very successful. Um, I got a lot of images 
And you've seen a lot of these images on some of my other talks. Um, I, I've used them to publish uh, in my articles as illustrations. A lot of them have been published in the readers' galleries of Sky and Telescope and Astronomy Magazine. Celestron used a lot of my images to sell C14s, and they used some of them as the background on their web page. And I've even had professional astronomers uh, use my images to uh, illustrate some of their research articles and press releases. So let's do a review of the program. What can I say? For over 25 years, this was my cathedral to the stars. I have countless fond memories of being out there and imaging all these objects. I think it's a great dome at an affordable price that a lot of amateurs can afford. It's really versatile. Uh, by having some number of wall rings, you can put it on your roof if you want to. Uh, you can make it tall, you can make it short, you can put doors in it, you can rotate it with motors, you can open and close the shutter with motors if you if you want. Uh, the, being fiberglass, the parts are lightweight, so it's not going to cause sagging of your of your soil, and it also means you can assemble it yourself. It has a lot of very clever. Uh, Rube Goldberg mechanisms. If you don't know what Rube Goldberg is, think of the uh, game Mousetrap, where you, you turn a crank and it kicks a boot that knocks a ball down a staircase that lands in a bucket that flips a teeter-totter. So there are all kinds of those things in this observatory where you pull a lever that pulls on a cable that moves a spring that sets a latch. Uh, and some of those are good and some of them were not so good. The shutter mechanism on this is absolutely brilliant. So I showed you that slot earlier. What, what you put on the center shutter piece up here at the top are two resin bars that are cut at angles. And so as you open the dome, this shutter piece is gonna get shoved out of its slot and will slide back and slide back until it hits a stop. <clears throat> and then when it does that, as the other shutter keeps moving forward, it will disengage. And then when you wanna close it, this will go for it. It'll hook that and pull this other shutter piece, which will then come back up and drop into the slot, and then it's all latched. So it was absolutely genius. Um, I have a lot of other pros. Prodome and Technical Innovations has great customer service. Jerry Smith now owns the company, and anytime I called Jerry that I needed a part or a replacement thing or had a problem, he was on the phone. And he said, I'll put that in the mail to you tomorrow. You'll have it in one or two days. This dome can be moved if necessary. You can disassemble it in large block pieces, load it up in the back of a truck and take it to a new location. So I've moved this dome twice. Uh, and curiously, when I set it up in my current home, I didn't need a single permit. Uh, it has excellent durability. This fiberglass is gonna be around long after I'm gone and it has high resale value. When I sold the dome, I had lots of interested buyers, people willing to drive from Indiana and Texas to come and pick it up. The dome slot is very wide. It's 36 inches, which gives you quite a bit of time before it has to be moved. And the dome slot extends well past the zenith, which also allows you to observe for long periods of time. The dome interior is blue, which absorbs red light. If you're in there working with a red flashlight or red headlight, and it looks, that comes out black. So it stays very, very dark inside. The dome has superb security. I didn't have a single problem with it. In fact, it had four levels of security. There are little electric contact plates in the back that are in a certain position. And if the dome isn't in a magic position, the contact plates don't make contact and you can't open the shutter. Um, then there was a deadbolt lock that you had to have one key for to disengage the deadbolt on the shutters. And then you had to have another key to turn on the power for the electric shutter motor. And I also had a master switch in my house that are in the garage that turned off power to the whole thing. So that provided me with four levels of security so that it was never ever disturbed. And let's not forget, you can decorate your dome for holidays. Every Halloween, I would decorate it as the great pumpkin rising over my fence. For Christmas, you can decorate it as Frosty the Snowman, and you can also make it into Humpty Dumpty with a big crack in the dome for Easter. Now, it does have some cons. Um, I found it very difficult to get the base ring and the dome support ring both circular so they rotated smoothly around each other. What I found is that the door jams on the left and right side of the door, uh, door were flatter than the dome ring arcs, and it didn't really complete 
the arc of the wall rings and make a perfectly round circle like I needed. And so if the dome is out of round, when you rotate it, you end up with an ellipse grinding against a circle and it will grind and scrape. So here's an illustration of that. You know, you can have the, the inner circle is the dome, uh, is the wall ring and the outer circle is the dome support ring. And if you get these uh, not quite circular, then when you rotate, you end up with contact points. And that happened a lot. It would scrape and, and, and grind. Um, and I, I never could get that flat wall jam section to be completely perfectly circular, try as I might. So as you can see, when you look at this, that is considerably flatter than those arcing uh, wall rings that I had. And no matter what I did, I couldn't make it into a very complete circle. And you can see that here. Here's the these arcing wall rings. They're quite circular. And then you get to this very flat door jam and door section that is not as curved as the rest of it was. Uh, the electric shutter motor was very fairly loud. It sounds like a coffee grinder. And I was being very careful to try to open the shutter before people went to bed and uh, you know, I tried to close it as, uh, in the morning if I could. The dome rotation motors were incredibly loud. Um, they were so loud, I removed them and sold them and decided that for the sake of neighborhood peace, I would just turn the dome manually. And the dome itself acts like a parabolic dish shooting the sound of those motors right out through the slot. So as the dome rotates, it, it acts like a, a ray gun shooting sound at whatever direction that is. Uh, pointed. So I found them not uh, a good choice. And even the manual dome rotation is somewhat loud. It's about as loud as opening a garage door. I had new neighbor, neighbors move in and they said, gee, we know you're a surgeon and you have to go in on call signs in the middle of the night. But, you know, some nights we hear you open and close your garage door 10 times. And I I, I actually don't put my car in my garage. Um, I park it in the driveway. And I, then I realized they were hearing me rotating the dough. And so I said, is that a problem? They said, oh no, we only hear it when we're awake. Once we go to sleep, it doesn't bother us anymore. Now, another problem is that you must rotate the dome slot to align with the door to go in and out. And that means you've got to stop imaging if for any reason you need to go in or out. There is no limit switch on the electric shutter motor. You have to stop it before it gets to either fully open or fully closed. And if you don't do that, then you can lose the tension on the cables that are opening and closing that shutter and they become entangled. So I'll explain that. So this is a diagram of the electric shutter motor and how it's wired up around pulleys on the edges of the slot. So back here is a windlass and it uh, it's a screw powered by a motor and this goes up and down a screw. And as it does that, it feeds cable out in one direction and reels it in in the other direction. And the tension has to be maintained on those wires at all times or it will foul up. So there are screw, uh, excuse me, springs on each end of this system to maintain the tension. But if you over open it or over, over close it, you can exceed the limits of those springs and foul it up. And so this is the windlass with the motor down at the bottom and you can see the screw. And this is an instance when it got fouled up. So here's a close up and uh, you know, at the top and the bottom, the cable is nicely wound around the screw grooves but here it got fouled. And so what you have to do then is uh, take the cables off the pulleys and spend hours of your life that you will never get back, uh, winding it tight around each one of these grooves. And of course, as you do, you feed out more distance and it just tends to get more fouled up. So to be honest, there were times where I took the whole thing off the back of the dome. I sent it into Jerry Smith and I said, just give me all new cables and wire it up with your machine and ship it back to me. And I would put it back in the dome. Fortunately, they did come out with a new, better electric shutter motor. This one only has, it has two posts uh, with 10 wraps of the cable. This is the open or closed cable. That's the open cable. And uh, if it gets fouled up, it's a lot simpler to re-thread it. Uh, and another blessing is that this motor was considerably quieter than the original. Well, then I ran into other problems with my CompuStar C14. The next problem that happened is I was getting backlash in the declination motor. And I couldn't calibrate on a guide star some nights. Sometimes I do 10 runs of a trying to get a calibration on the declination drive, and it would fail, 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 and I'd finally get one. 
And so I thought, wow, that's just one more problem on this myriad pile of problems I've got with this CompuStar 14. Uh, maybe it's time to move on and get a better new telescope. Um, so I, you know, going to AIC and seeing exhibits and things like that, I decided I would get a CDK 17. And I want to thank Larry Weatherly at Plane Wave as a customer representative because, you know, I also thought, well, should I get a 20 or a 24 inch telescope? And he actually told me not to, even though he could have made a lot more money for the company selling me one of those telescopes. He said the CDK 17 is the sweetest of the scopes. He says it's sharp. He said you actually don't quite get as good as stuff with a 20. And he said if you're in the city and not out at some dark sky site, he said, you're going to get much better results with a 17. And I wanted to put that on an L500 mount, which is direct drive. So it has no gears, no periodic error, no backlash. Uh, you know, this joins Richard Wright's movement of auto guiding needs to go away. And this is the kind of mount that'll do it. I mean, it can track flawlessly for long periods certainly long enough to get a stack of short exposures. I was gonna mount it equatorially again, so I needed a wedge, and I definitely wanted an automatic focuser rotator so I could compose my images and acquire my guide stars without having to use Rodney's rotator. And I got a uh, Delta T system for dew control. So I, uh, you know, I waited a while before I ordered this because I knew I would have to tear this dome down rip up the deck, take out the old pier, and put in a much larger pier that could handle the torques of an L500 mount. And I was kind of loath to do that. But, you know, one day I was talking to my wife and my son, and we agreed I was going to order the new telescope. And then, you know, they said, gee, aren't you going to get a new dome to go with the new telescope? And I instantly flew to the defense of my dome. I mean, I, I loved my dome. And I said, you know, this is a perfectly good dome. It's, it's, it's a high quality dome and they said well you know it kind of scrapes and creaks and i said well i spray it with silicon and it's quiet for another couple of weeks and they said and, and and those you know those shutters get fouled up every now and then and you get so frustrated you know certainly there must be something you know better that you could get and it finally dawned on me that i was being an absolute idiot here i am arguing with my wife and my son who are trying to talk me into getting a better dome so i instantly shut up and i said you know i'll look into that so I went on the internet and I found Dave Miller of Observatory Solutions. Uh, and I called Dave and I said, so Dave, I want to get a CDK 17 on an L500 with a, a wedge and everything. And he says, fine. He said, I can, I can order those things for you. And I said, but I want to know, talk about the observatory. You know, should I uh, tear down the 10-foot the, the dome and then reassemble it better? And maybe you professionally could do a better job of getting it round than I could. Should I scrap this one and get a whole new casting of the ProDome 10? And he said, you know, I put in ProDome 10s all around the world. And he says, you know, they're okay. And he said, but if you're going to get a CDK-17 and an L500, he said, I really think you should get an ash dome. He said, they're more expensive, but you will never ever regret that decision and he said why don't you send me some images of your location and he said i've got software i could show you what this will all look like so i knew about ash domes from you know years of reading sky and telescope and you know formerly i thought these are really only for you know a college and uh university observatories so i was very intrigued and so he pretty quickly sent me these images of what the system would look like. And, you know, with all the heights and dimensions. And he said, you know, you will need a 30 inch diameter concrete pier to hold the um, uh, mounting and you'll have to cut a bigger hole in the deck. So yes, you'll have to tear it all up. Um, and I said, I'm in. So I disassembled the uh, ProDome 10. I put it on the market. I sold it to a gentleman in Seattle who was very happy to get it. And I took the C14 CompuStar and I sold that to a Celestron collector in Kansas. Uh, and then I hired a deck company that came and they took up all the boards and they jackhammered out the concrete from the old steel pier that I had in there. And then Dave Miller sent me plans for the concrete pier. And he said, there are two ways you can do this. You could just get a pure cylindrical pier that's 30 inches in diameter with quite a bit going under the ground. 
but the I don't know what your soil conditions are. He said, if it's soft clay-like soil, he says, this could lean over time and throw off your entire you know, polar alignment. He said, the safer option will be to get a footing in the ground uh, that will, you know, that's all supported by rebar. And up here was a picture that he had of what the concrete footing with rebar would be. So and I pitched Rod, this at, yeah. Um, do you need to take a breath? <laughs> no. Uh, how much more do you have to cover? Very little. Oh, we okay. I thought this was the, so this is the coup de gras, the, uh, well, do you want to take a break? Okay. Are there any questions? Well, as long as I've interrupted you, are there any questions, Molly? Um, no, I haven't actually seen any. I've been prompting people to remember to uh, ask some questions, but I think people are just enjoying hearing the story. I'm enjoying hearing the story for sure. <laughs> well, thanks, okay. Molly. With, without delay, then let's go ahead. We'll go back at it. So um, I got 10, I pitched this at 10 concrete contractors in Portland and eight of them just turned me down flat. They wanted nothing to do with casting up here for an observatory. They just said, just too, too critical, too fussy, too, no thank you. Um, I had one guy who was interested but didn't take the job and I had you know, the, the concrete contractor who took it said, I think this is the coolest job I've ever done. I'm gonna put this, this peer in for you. And so he, he said, no, the soil's too soft. I don't recommend just the cylindrical approach. He said, uh, that cylinder is going to weigh well over a ton, and you will need an equal amount of concrete footing in the ground to stop it from leaning. So uh, he you know, set up a thing. And there, what you can't see here is there's a cylindrical thing that does go down farther so that, it, that even the footing won't lean. And he set rebar on that. And then he constructed the rebar cage that Dave had in the diagram. He's got this machine back here that bends uh, straight rebar into circles. And he welded this all together. And so he then did the concrete pier in two castings. Uh, he poured the uh, rectangular footing first, and then he set the rebar cage in it. And then he put a large sono tube, 30 inch uh, uh, casting tube around that. And then the next day they poured the cylinder. So uh, that was the pouring of the concrete. But it was now January and the temperatures outside were around 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And he said, this casting cannot freeze for a week. It has to cure. And so he set up a tent around it and he ran uh, extension cords in there for heaters. And he said, you gotta check it every now and then with a, with a thermometer gun and make sure it doesn't go below freezing temperature. He said, but the heaters should do the job. Well, you know, the next night it was a windstorm in Portland. So imagine my horror when I woke up and found that the tent had blown off and gotten stuck in the corner of the fence and the gate. And I didn't know how long this thing had been exposed. I was counting on the fact that two tons of concrete would probably take several hours to cool down. Uh, and so I shot it with a temperature gun. Unfortunately, it was still above freezing. So I set up the tent around it and weighted it down with a lot more weight. And a couple of weeks later, he took off the sono tube and the casting was quite successful. He said, you can launch a rocket off this thing and it's not gonna shake a bit. So the next thing I had to do was get uh, the electrical contract to come out and run the conduits for the uh, electrical outlets in the observatory and to the telescope. So that was done. And then I had the deck people come back and they uh, laid down the deck boards, cutting a new bigger opening for the larger pier and uh, new places for the electrical conduits to come through. So this was all finished around March, but I still had to wait until um, uh, May, until the observatory construction uh, it, uh, by Ash Dome was complete. So then uh, Dave Miller said, we're gonna do construction in mid-May. And so the observatory was shipped to the house and it was delivered on very large pallets. Uh, there were two of these pallets that were then dropped off in the driveway. And then uh, on a Sunday night, Dave Miller showed up and began unpacking all of this equipment. Here you can see the, the dome support rings and the shutter sections and things. And so Dave Miller arrived and began unpacking this. 
um, you know, Dave has a fee to come here and do this work. This is an observatory that unlike the prodome, I would have been completely unable to assemble myself. I mean, there are just thousands of bolts and rivets in, in this. And I got to tell you, compared to what I paid for electrical contractors and deck contractors and concrete workers, Dave's prices are incredibly reasonable. Uh, he can't do this by himself. He said, I'll also need you to contract three workers to help me. And it will take about five days to assemble the observatory. So I just had the uh, people who did the deck work uh, be the workers. And one advantage of that is that, you know, he needed ladders and scaffolding and other kinds of things. And, uh, you know, the, that deck and fencing company had all that equipment and included it in the price for the three workers. So I thought I would have to take five days off to be here for uh, the observatory construction and, you know, provide things if needed and, and, and supervise and dave said no he said you go remove cancers from people and uh every day when you come back he says you'll see i've got a part of the observatory done and in about five days we'll be done so they went at it and each day i came home and i got to snap a picture of what had been done that day so on day one they had laid the base ring around on the deck and then once again you can see i have cut the corner off this deck so that it's under 100 square feet once again, I didn't need any permits at all at this site for this observatory. When I met with the city, they said, it's under 100 square feet. It's less than 15 feet high. Go ahead. So that was great. I did need electrical permits. Um, so uh, the next day on day two, they started putting curved plywood siding around these beams after they'd gotten the top ring on the studs of the wall. And here you can see the plywood siding wrapping around and they had to cut sections off to go for the steel door. Uh, then they installed the steel door and put, began putting on the metal siding on day three. And after three days, all the siding had been put on and the door was in place. And then on day four, they set up the scaffolding, which you can see off to the left inside and they took the dome quadrant sections and one by one by one they put them up there uh, you can see a worker on top of the scaffolding up inside the dome and uh, don't the dome construction was essentially done on day four and then on day five they applied the shutters so there is the completed dome after five days of construction. So also on day five, the telescope mount and wedge and other accessories arrived from plane wave. Um, so you can see the L500 uh, mount that's already been uncrated. The CDK 17 crate is there and the wedge crate is back behind them. So uh, there is the CDK 17 all packaged up inside its crate. And so they then drilled holes into the top of the concrete pier and mounted the wedge and then hoisted up the L500 mount on the wedge. Uh, and Dave did a superb job of, you know, checking uh, the plumb line on the top of that um, pier every day at astronomical noon. So he got a very good fix on how to orient that for, uh, for Celestial North. And then my son and Dave helped hoist the CDK-17 up onto its mount. And the CDK or the L500 has through the mount cabling. So Dave did a superb job of running all the cables. You can see them through these open access doors for everything. Uh, you know, the, the focuser, the rotator, the Delta T control, the camera. Um, and uh, then he worked on the back of the telescope on cable management. And even if you do this for a, for a profession, you can tell by the look on Dave's face that, you know, cable management is just yuck. But he did a superb job. He tested it in every possible position and rotation, making sure there was no way that the cables would ever become fouled. And at long last, we had finished the entire observatory. Um, so there we have the CDK-17 on the L500 mount and wedge inside the 10 foot 6 inch ash dome. Uh, the only permits I needed were the electrical permits. So electrical inspector came out and the only thing he wanted to see was that it had a master cutoff switch. That was the only, but you know, once again, this guy said, wow, this is the coolest inspection I've done in 35 years. And he just kept wanting pictures of himself taken by the dome and by the telescope. And he FaceTimed his wife in, look, look where I am. I'm inside an observatory in someone's backyard. 
So Ash Dome Pros, this is a fantastic dome. I absolutely love it. I mean, this is the real thing. As much as I loved my Pro Dome 10 for 10 years and had wonderful times and memories in it, it the Sash Dome kind of makes it seem like it's a plastic toy. Um, the dome slot is equally wide at 36 inches. The dome slot also extends well past the zenith for extended imaging time. One thing I like about this that the Pro Dome 10 didn't have, the Pro Dome 10 shutter started at the bottom and retracted all the way up to the top. This has two independent shutters. There's a lower shutter that covers from the horizon to up to 30 degrees. And I'm rarely going to image below 30 degrees. So that provides more shielding from stray light and keeps the dome uh, with much less ambient light in it. The shutter motors are much quieter on this one. All I can hear is a low hum that I can barely hear in the house when the shutters are opening and closing. Uh, not at all the motor grinder sound or the coffee grinder sound that we had with the Pro Dome 10. The rotation motor is very quiet. I actually don't hear it, neither does my family. One thing I really appreciate now compared to the Pro Dome 10 is having this independent door that is completely below the dome and the dome support ring, which means I can enter and exit as much as I want anytime I want without turning the dome and interrupting my imaging. And this steel door is quite heavy and very secure. Nobody's gonna get inside that dome ever without the key. This has superb electronics. You can see them on the wall and up on the rim. And so, you know, it's all motorized and you can synchronize the dome slot with the telescope motion. So it tracks effortlessly all night long. And when I'm done, I just hit park and the dome swings back to the position you see it in out and parks itself and you can close up the shutters for the night. Customer service is also superb. Unfortunately, when this arrived, the encoder for the dome rotation wasn't working properly and I wasn't getting right readings on it. So they shipped me one and they said, here, plug it into the main uh, electronics box and let us know if that fixes it. I plugged it in and all the electronics in the dome blew and the shutter was open. So I sent an email and I got a, a rapid reply from uh, Riley Brannon at, at, in the middle of the night. And he said, go out to the dome, open up that uh, electronics box, hook this wire up to that one and move that wire to there. He was doing it with FaceTime and he hot wired the thing and we were able to get it closed because rain was due the next day. But he flew out right after that with a complete new set of electronics at absolutely no cost to me and installed it and got it all working in a matter of hours. Uh, and that qualifies for me as absolutely superb level customer service. Um, and it's worked flawlessly since. So my cons of the Ash Domes, I really don't have many. Um, I would have to say it's quite expensive compared to the Pro Dome. Um, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to assemble it yourself. I mean, the manual is, you know, the thickness of the Los Angeles telephone pages. You have to pretty much hire a contractor, unless you're a contractor or an engineer yourself, to build it. Um, this dome would be difficult, but not impossible to move. Uh, what they recommend is that, you know, uh, when they build these larger domes, they use cranes to hoist them up and put them on the support building. So you can lift it off with a crane and truck it to another location and then disassemble the support building and reassemble it at another site. Uh, the dome interior surface is metal compared to the dark blue fiberglass in the dome. So it's reflective and so it's brighter. So I have to be really careful that, you know, my computer laptop screen is covered up and flashing LEDs, I, you know, need to be covered up with black tape so you don't get internal reflections that would give you gradients in your images. This is the one thing I really did dislike in my family, my wife and my son particularly, is that the dome finish is easily marred and scratched. As far as I can tell from looking at the images I took of the pallets, it arrived in pristine condition. Uh, but I think these scratches either, I don't think they happened during shipping, I think they happened during the actual construction. And you can see in this lower right image, there, there are handprints and fingerprints of the construction workers that got left there. And if you try to clean that with a cleaner, it just smears and gets bigger and makes a bigger blemish. So, you know, uh, my wife said, this is like you bought a new car on the you know, show floor and when they drove it out, it's got a bunch of scratches on the finish. 
but it's cosmetic. It doesn't affect the function of it all. So this is Nicholas Clark. He's my best astro imaging buddy. And Nicholas recently retired from the United Kingdom to Kahuna, Victoria, Australia. And uh, Nicholas and I bought identical CDK-17 and L-500 with wedge systems. And so uh, we have now formed what we call the Clark Pommier Global Astrophotography Network. Nicholas can image things in the Southern Hemisphere and send me all the data that I want. I can image things in the Northern Hemisphere that he cannot, and I send him images. And together, we're gonna cover the entire sky over our years ahead. So the beauty of getting the new Ash Dome and the CDK-17 and L-500 system is I have basically eliminated all of these problems that fixed me for so many years with my ProDome 10 and my CopyStar C14. And so with this new Ash Dome and this new mount and telescope, surely it is the best of times. With that, I will stop sharing. Well, that's great, Rod. I mean, that's a great presentation. You had us all. I, there probably weren't any questions because everyone was just focusing on your presentation. Well, good. Um, Thank you. But I do have a question for you. Yes, sir. I can't imagine what that budget is, and it's none of our business, so please don't tell us. I didn't mention hardly any dollar amounts on purpose. So don't. Please don't. <laughs> but I, I have to ask. Uh, you're still using the Gray Lady, the 11,000 camera. Yeah, you keep bringing this up. Have you considered going to one of the CMOS, like one of the um, Moravians or even the Yeah, I, I'm considering a Moravian, but I, I honestly love the Gray Lady. It is a great camera. I know it very, very well. You know, and I keep reading articles and watching, you know, astro imaging channels about CMOS and it's like they say that gee if you take a whole bunch of short exposure images with a CMOS it's as good as a long exposure with a CCD well I can take a long exposure with a CCD um, and you know every time you tweak something you get a whole new camera when it comes to uh, calibration and things like that so terry you know back me up here you have the gray lady as well and i think you've said the same thing you don't see a reason to change it um i know that you think the smithsonian is calling for yours uh eric um but um I, i'm no no i <laughs> i switched over to cmos and terry switched i had an eleven thousand two, which i sent him and he's using that but with the gray lady with the 11,000 the filters are behind or they yeah you're they are behind the fil the the filters and there were objects that i could not image uh with the CompuStar c14 particularly if i was doing hydrogen alpha work mm -hmm. like i described in my previous talk on on dark nebulae uh you know put an h felt H alpha filter in in front of your one potential dim guide star that you have and you lose it. And so there are a bunch of, Im of objects I could never image. It is not an issue with the L500 mount. Um, it tracks so flawlessly so long, I can do a 15 second exposure of a dim star behind a hydrogen alpha filter. And it says, yeah, I'll nudge the mount that amount because it's, it's, you know, arc seconds, micro arc seconds off the actual place it's supposed to be. Um, so, you know, I bought a remote guiding head and, and a MOAG that I thought when I have the new telescope, I can put it in front of it. I am finding it, I won't need to do that ever. And all, all these things that I couldn't image have now become potential targets for me with this new system. So what is your field of view? I noticed that you had hedges and looked like some trees around. Yeah, uh, the uh most of the trees started about 45 degrees we were talking about this uh last week when you know we said uh you don't want to image the same object all night long you want to switch around and get the, the prime targets that are high above the sky and what i said is i have trees that do that for me it's like if something gets <laughs> down to about 45 degrees the tree blocks it out and you need a new target so i have uh 
big cedar trees directly to the north. You actually can't see Polaris, but you don't need to to get a, an accurate polar alignment with the, the software. And virtually anything that's hidden behind that cedar tree will swing up, you know, with the we great wheel of the, of the northern sky and become imageable. Um, I have a lot more clear sky to the west. The reason for the tall hedge on the west side of the observatory is that there's a church parking lot over there uh, on the west side of my house, and they have uh, actual street lights that are glaring. And I, I built that hedge to cast a shadow. Um, now the telescope is up above the top of that hedge. I'll probably trim it down a few feet and get a, a bit more sky. It didn't matter before when I wasn't imaging to the west of the meridian. Molly, did you have any questions on YouTube? Um, not seeing any additional ones besides the ones that you've already asked. Um, yep. People wanted a link to your website. I gave it. <laughs> so, so what is next? What is next? Or are you, is this for the next 10 years you're going to be happy? Or The, you, the next thing is automation. That's uh, what I, my next question was. We were discussing this last week and I, you know, I'm yeah. still learning the ropes of, of running everything, but uh, you know, it's a whole new world for me. It's like, I go out and just initialize stuff, come in the house and I just push start and you know, the thing images and the next more, you know, when I'm done, yeah, I just push a button, the telescope parks, the dome goes to park position, the shutters close and you're, and you're done. Um, so, you know, Tim, last week told rod when you're ready to automate this thing you know send me a message and uh, i'll help you so i'm i'm looking forward to automating where it'll it'll all be done for me automatically and the dome uh tracks with your your target yes it does and so that must be automated to some degree yeah there's a program that comes with it called maestro 4 and that has all of the dome operations and um, what, you know, it, opening and closing of shutters, uh, parking position, but you, you calibrate the dome. You basically, it, there's, a, there's a limit switch and you rotate the dome around once in, in, in clockwise direction and it detects where the limit switch is. And then you do it the opposite direction and it detects where the limit switch is. And then you tell it the azimuth of your limit switch, which is 2, 270. And you, you have to put some other things in there about how high is your telescope, how offset uh, is the intersection of the RA and deck axes. And after that, it knows where your telescope's looking and it puts the dome slot right there and it updates, uh, I think every few seconds it updates. And you know when it decides it's time to nudge the motor, uh, it does it. And uh, it hasn't ruined a single image. I am so glad that I, went for the big pier because I can jump up and down on my deck, I can slam the door and the, the dome motor can rotate and I have not gotten a single jiggly image with any of that. So does it have a weather sensor as well? No, I don't have weather sensing yet. So if it's the middle of the night and you hear the rumble of thunder, you're... I would be in trouble. <laughs> um, it, another question. It, oh, go ahead, Eric. Well, it does rain a bit in, in the north. Well, yeah, you're from the northwest like me. Yeah, so, I did rain uh, stuff. Thick. When I did my uh, measuring the distance of the Andromeda galaxy with uh, the C, the copy oh, yeah, star C14, that. you crazy. said, I can't, you know, I'm from the northwest too. I can't imagine how you had enough clear nights to pull off 57 <laughs> nights of, of getting a, a Cepheid period. And yeah, it was, I got lucky. It was a challenge. But it's another reason I love having a dome because you, we get a lot of unexpected sudden clearings. And if you if you don't have a, a setup ready to go, you just can't capture a lot of that valuable time. That's the good thing about having an automated rod is that you can just leave it alone. It, you know, three o'clock in the morning, it, it, it clears up. It'll just wake up, image for a couple of hours, and go back to sleep. Great. And you I get, think you that get a lot we're more... highly recommending that you take Tim up on on his offer. Oh, along I will. With a, I will. Along I will with a weather sensor. Offer. He was so generous. I said that was the best offer I'd have all week. And I'll, I'll just whisper again, CMOS camera. <laughs> I've been running uh, both the, the TI dome and my uh, scope dome automated for quite some time. And the scope dome is uh, like yours. It's like 
quite it's quite more sophisticated. It has weather stations and everything built into the dome electronics. So it will sense humidity yeah. and do and do and stuff. And, uh, it's 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 a whole new level when you get to use all of those facilities. Right. A couple other questions from the uh, YouTube chit chat. Um, what was the first thing you photographed with the new setup with the CDK and the? Yeah, a lot of people wanted to know that. Um, <laughs> I wanted to catch the supernova in M one hundred and one. Oh yeah. And did you? No. <laughs> uh, it was too late. Oh, by the no. time, by the time the you know with the dome malfunction and stuff like that, I didn't. So um, I, you know, I, I went around and shot a bunch of quick snapshots. I, I didn't, I've never got, been able to get the Trifid Nebula. It's too low and um, things. And um, I, I, you know, I can get it now. But I'm writing another article for Astronomy Magazine and I needed a couple targets for that article if I'm gonna get it in by deadline. And um, M74, no, M54 appears for five minutes between two trees about 11 degrees above my horizon. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> and so that really was my first target, Molly. Um, I did five minutes night after night after night. Of oh, nice. And then I did five minutes of reds and five minutes of greens. And I, I now have my image to illustrate my next article. Um, and I, so that... That was because otherwise I'd have to wait a whole year. And by the way, big shout out to Molly because she is the new contributing editor to Astronomy Magazine. And um, yeah, that's that's going to be great for your career, Molly. And we look forward to reading your your writings each month. Yeah, thank you. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Rod, would you like a data set of uh, 101 with the I'd love one. Nice. I'd love one. I mean, I, I, I captured the, um, uh, the last supernova in 2014, um, and the M82 super. So my M my M82 supernova images were used on the Discovery Channel uh, on how the universe works. They contacted me uh, for that, and you know they're on screen for a flash, <laughs> uh, and then. Uh, the supernova in 2011 and M51, I was contacted by a group of radio astronomers in Europe who connected radio telescopes in Finland and the UK and Germany and, you know, made this huge Europe-sized radio telescope to get the first high-resolution image of a supernova uh, right after it occurred in M51. And, of course, you know, their image is this little orange blip. And so they contacted me and said, we've looked all over the internet at images of the supernova in visual, and we think yours is the best. Could we please use it in our publication and our press release? I said, let me think about that. Yes. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me, I love that. Let me think about it. Yes. That's so that's great. on my website. Mm -hmm. So I'll send you a uh, data set for 101. Great. Now the, the bad news was I image 101 and like four days later, it popped. Four days after going, that. Yeah, I go, well, crud. It, it, has, it stayed bright for quite a while. Like I imaged it, I think two nights after discovery. Um, and it was so bright that uh, I actually saw it visually in a, um, what size dob was that? Uh, a 16 inch dob. Wow. Um, I, I, under Bortle 5, yeah, it was very cool. Uh, and yes, it stayed bright for weeks, and I, I need to go check what the most recent um, measurements are. I think it, I think it is dimming now, but uh, I've got some images I need to put together of see if I can see the dimming across a couple of weeks of imaging I've been doing. Uh, wow. So we'll see what I can get out of that. Well, as soon as I missed it, I went back and got some luminosity of the Nova, and then put it into the image. Yeah. You can do that. I don't that's think that's. Fair. I don't think that's cheating. That's you know. no. By the time I had things up and running, it was behind our uh, silver maple tree and like missed it. Mm -hmm. and, and you uh, can't cut down a tree in Portland. Not in Oregon. <laughs> I, was telling, I was telling Eric and the crew last week that um, that you know when you look at that that original house, there was a evergreen tree against the side of the house next to the chimney that I had planted, and I had to get permits to take that tree out 
that was another set of permits I needed. And I had a, a, an arborist come over with a chainsaw to take the tree out. And he started up the chainsaw and people called 911. I'm kidding, not. Um, <laughs> and it's because when people hear chainsaws, they think someone's cutting down some old Douglas fir, old growth that's up there on that hill with us. And, and they might be. So, you know, you, you call 911 and ask questions later. So the, 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 they, showed, they tracked down the chainsaw and I showed them the permit. They said, okay, sorry to bother you, but. So you have old growth uh, evergreens up there? Oh yeah, up on that hill, yeah. Um, there's another question in the chat about uh, how do you do your flats? Do you do sky flats or do you have an internal flat panel of some kind? So for the CompuStar C14, I had a, I, I think it's 420 millimeter, I'm not quoting the size exactly, Aurora flat panel from Gerd Newman. And um, it was it was much bigger than the aperture of the C14. So I was going to sell it on Astromart, but I got out of tape measure. I said, oh, that might just be big enough for the CDK17. Let me keep it. And so the telescope arrived, and it's just that much too small. So I, I am going to sell it. So I ordered a 500 and something Aurora flat panel, which is it arrived by FedEx from Germany right over here. And um, but in the interim, I did I did twilight flats, and I, I find those very frustrating. It's like it gets dark really quickly. You start getting stars showing up with that f six point nine system, so you have to do median. You have to move the telescope so the stars are in different positions. I, you know, they work. I've, I've I've run some calibration with them, but um, now I mean it's another advantage of an observatory, and having that rotator makes all the difference because it's such a precise rotator. So I can shoot as long as I record what the rotation readings are. And then I can come back later on, point the scope straight up at the thing, climb up the ladder and put the panel on top of it. And I could shoot flats for any previous session with absolute precise reproduction of what it was, as long as there isn't a new dust mode. Is, um, is there, you have one more question? Cause we're running a little bit late, Molly. I think that's it for the chat. Okay, if there are no more questions, Rod, thanks so much. He, he, we were all mesmerized by that. I'm Great. glad it was you going through all that rather than us, because that yep. sounds me. It sounds like you probably glossed over some of the issues that were oh, I frustrating. Oh, I a lot of stuff that you just don't need to annoy you all with that I had to be annoyed with. <laughs> no, no, actually, when you when someone else is going through it, it's not annoying. <laughs> Jordan Freida, huh? <laughs> So, uh, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed Rod's presentation. Hope that everyone will see you next week, or you'll see us next week, I guess. And if we're all done, Terry, are you you're in control? Take us out, and we'll see everyone, or you'll see us next week. So, good night or good morning, wherever you are. Good night.